tell you what, good evening. It is truly, truly an honor to join you here today at the Daughters of American Revolution's National Defense Night. Constitution Hall is such a beautiful and historic treasure. And I've had the pleasure of attending performances at this venue as a member of the audience, but never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be fortunate enough to be honored here with my colleagues on the stage. This is truly, truly humbling. I tell you what, we're still early in the evening, uh, but it's already been amazing so far, hasn't it? <laughs> the United States Marine Corps Band was absolutely awesome, weren't they? I tell you. It's enough to make an army, say, uh, army soldier say, oorah, instead of oorah. <laughs> I tell you, our, our military is really blessed with the tradition of having soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coasties who are also professional musicians within our ranks. They motivate us and they inspire us. And it makes me proud and grateful for the opportunity to serve as a soldier in America's army and to be part of the best armed forces that the world has ever seen. General Dillon, thank you so much for that very kind introduction and for such an honor for an award. I really truly appreciate having been invited to participate in this celebration and what a celebration it was. I mean, to see all those flags parade forward, to see our flag um, come down from the, the, you know, from the ceiling, from the rafters here, uh, it's truly moving. And if those of you out there who aren't as equally moved uh, as a physician, I might need to come out there and take your pulse. <laughs> I'm you, what, a, uh, what a celebration. And I tell you, tonight's grand ceremony is a testament to the DAR's patriotism and service to our nation, as well as a strong commitment to preserving history and educating others about the richness of it. Your message of moving forward in service to America is inspiring and truly captures the essence of the dedication the Daughters of the American Revolution have to our nation. It's demonstrated by the members of this great organization who have contributed over 13 million volunteer hours towards preserving history, educating, and instilling patriotism in America. And I thank each of you here tonight for all you do to support our nation, and I applaud you. Thank you. And the awards being presented tonight reflect great leaders and show that who showed courage and resolve in the most trying of times. As you just recently heard, Margaret Cochran Corbin, a Revolutionary War hero who manned her husband's cannon after he was mortally wounded in the Battle of Fort Washington, is the very definition of heroism. Imagine watching your loved one injured and then die before your very eyes, and then have the wherewithal to continue the fight, not fall into insoluble grief or, to, or withdraw in fear, but pick up the, the board evacuator, clean out the gun, and keep on firing. Can you imagine that? As the mother of a soon-to-be field artillery officer, I'm inspired by her story of bravery. Mary Corbin's story represents all of our female service members who have stepped forward in harm's way and answered the call to service since the founding of our nation. Her story also showcases that the wearing of the cloth of our nation at times has been a family business since our very beginning. Brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, daughters and sons in arms serving our nation is our history. That is the reason I'm here today, the reason that I've had the privilege and the opportunity to become the Surgeon General of the United States Army and the Commanding General of the U.S. Army Medical Command. The opportunity to lead over 100,000 medical professionals, including our active guard and reserve soldiers, our wonderful Department of the Army civilians and contractors, all charged with ensuring the health and the medical readiness of our soldiers, our medical units, so they can deploy and support our, ma our nation in any mission that we're asked to do. 
And that's where the story of my military career will end, as I have reached the pinnacle of an amazing journey as a soldier. But let me tell you a little bit about where the story began. So it all started in 1939. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> but don't worry, I promise, I'll, I'll stop before midnight. <laughs> but seriously, it all started when a 19-year-old young man named Oscar George Grammer from New Orleans, Louisiana, do you want from Louisiana? <laughs> decided that he and a buddy would join the army. So he told, uh, told me later that the, uh, they actually signed up more for the free train ride to Fort Huachuca, Arizona, Arizona. <laughs> more than anything else. But he served. And even though he joined a segregated <coughs> army, he stayed because he saw the promise and the hope for a better life and a better America as the army led the way in transforming itself and society for the better. He used to tell us of how things were when he first arrived, that the cadre, who were all white, initially thought it was a punishment tour to have to train colored soldiers. But he saw them change over time. Slowly, he and his fellow trainees became not those soldiers, but their soldiers. The cadre took pride in their accomplishments, were able to joke and trade <laughs> stories of their families and their homes, and relate as human beings. It wasn't all rosy, but it was a start. And that's the start that my dad saw as a promise for a better way forward, for not only himself, his family, for our army, but for our nation. And the military was desegregated on the 26th of July, 1948, by a presidential order. That was well before the rest of the nation. And the Army has led the way in many areas of equality. Equal work for equal pay, women in service, uh, for just a few examples. My dad stayed serving in the Aleutian Islands during the World War II era and later in Korea and many other assignments in between. He started as a private but he ended a 33-year career as a Chief Warrant Officer for and a medical logistician. <laughs> but it didn't end there. He believed that everyone should spend time in uniform, serving our country, as he saw that it broke down barriers, allowed others from different parts of the United States, from different backgrounds, to get to know each other, on an up close and personal level, and to work together towards a common goal, defending our nation. So he started close to home with a mini draft, though he really didn't have to try too hard to get us all to sign on the dotted line, because my brothers and sisters and I grew up hearing the war stories over and over. <laughs> and over. <laughs> You know, we were laughing at the characters that were his buddies, remembering their names, the funny situations that he had, you know, the mess hall stories, all the, you know, vehicle stories that he had about his, his friends. We visualized the places he had been and just seeing the pride on his face with the retelling of each story that changed a little bit, got a little bit more grander, a little bit more embellished each time we told him. <laughs> but we were sold, we were hooked. Three of my sisters joined the Women's Army Corps. Any wax out here? Any form of wax? All right. Let's give them a round of applause. Right, so in the 1960s, they joined the Women's Army Corps and headed to Fort McClellan, Alabama, where they did their training. That's where all the wax were trained back then. So I see some Alabama contingent here. Right here. And so and that was a time when women weren't really serving in the military or serving in roles like that. Again, another indication of the progressiveness of our army, of having women serving. And then one of my sisters actually joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, known as WAFs. Any WAFs out there from our Air Force? I feel about you. And she went on to spend a 20-year career as a, a legal assistant. In a, in a legal field, as a paralegal. And then another sister joined the Navy. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the Navy, that's right. And she retired in 
retired after 31 years uh, as a Master Chief Petty Officer. And those of you who know about Master Chiefs, they don't play. Do we have any Master Chiefs out here? <laughs> yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. Master Chiefs do not play. They are a force to be reckoned with. And she was awesome. She joined the Navy during a time in 1973 after attending a secretarial school. She went to St. Patrick's Academy right here in Washington, D.C., uh, which the goal was to, change, to train um, women for the, secretary, for the workforce as secretaries. But she wanted something different. And so in 1973, she decided that she was going to join the Navy. A little bit of a rebel, you know, the rest of us Army, you know, but she had to be Navy, but that's okay. I love my shipmates. But what an example. What an example that I saw. She was the next older to me, my sister. An example of courage, of going for your dreams, reaching out to do something that was really not um, anyone, no one else in her school or her class ended up joining any of the services back then. In fact, they thought she was a little strange, you know, that she would want to do that. And she ended up being an Airedale, being a quality control officer. Her last uh, assignment was uh, on the USS Roosevelt in the Persian Gulf. So, uh, so that's what I saw growing up from my sisters. But it didn't end there. Four of my brothers joined the Army as well. My oldest brother, Peter, was an air defender during the Vietnam era and retired as a command sergeant major. So command sergeant majors are tough too. You don't mess with them either, right? <laughs> sergeant majors. When he was home on leave one time, I remember bringing him to my class for show and tell in his uniform. <laughs> When I was a kindergartner at Shepherd Elementary School, again, right here in Washington, D.C. And so just think what I had growing up around me. All that, uh, all of those uh, examples of commitment, service to our nation, that all started with my dad. And another brother served a tour with the military intelligence unit. And another was a transportation unit, uh, joined and served with the transportation unit. And then one brother graduated from West Point and became a field artillery officer also. And he's the one who motivated me to go for West Point because he graduated in 1976, and that's the summer that women were just being allowed to enter the service academies for the first time in the United States. And I You know, so I was the youngest of all, and the favorite, and they all know it, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I could not wait for my, my turn to join. I wanted to be a soldier, just like my dad and my older brothers and sisters. I had phenomenal examples of selfless service, commitment, discipline. And I learned the Army values long before General Dennis Reimer, our 33rd Chief of Staff of the Army, codified them and the values that we have now uh, that in the Army values. My parents taught me that, my brothers and sisters taught me that. Wasn't known as the Army values then, but I embodied that because they embodied it and taught them to me. And they, and they showed me the examples of what each one of those were. Each one of those Army values that we all know. Loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. I had examples of all of those in my household growing up, and what a great example, great examples they were. Right within my own family. I had trailblazers and motivators who showed me that anything was possible if I lived right and worked hard, as my mom always used to say. Within my own family, I had models of success to the point that it never occurred to me that joining the Army or attending a service academy or the many of the other accomplishments that I've been able to achieve were outside of my reach. And that family grew to include my husband of 30 years, Don West, that's sitting over there. So a dust-off pilot, also from Louisiana, who served our nation for 30 years, flying medevac missions in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, commanding the 86th Combat Support Hospital in Iraq, and again commanding the 44th Medical Brigade in Afghanistan during OIF and OEF, 
both during the surges when there were unfortunately many American casualties. He's been a great motivator and mentor throughout my career, and I definitely would not be here today if it were not for the encouragement, teamwork, and support that he's provided me. Thanks a lot. So you see, my family was and is a mini leadership academy. And I want to just spend a few moments on the topic of leadership. So Webster's Dictionary defines leadership as the capacity to lead. The Army, which takes pride in using more words than sometimes required, defines leadership as the process of influencing people by providing purpose, direction, and motivation while operating to accomplish the mission and improve the organization. Very few, if any, leaders ever succeed as an individual. They're adept at building teams, empowering others, and motivating others for a common goal. At a recent engagement on diversity I participated in in California, the moderator actually said it in one of the best ways I've ever heard it stated. We were talking about diversity, and he said, you know, diversity is a requirement, but inclusiveness is a decision. And I always thought that was a very, very powerful statement because our army and our, our military is very diverse and very inclusive. So we're diverse not by a requirement, but we're diverse because it's a decision. It's a decision by our army to have representatives of every race, religion, culture. We choose to be inclusive as an army. When I entered West Point as a young cadet in 1978, I was in the third class to accept women. And being accepted into the academy, being included and accepted as a cadet, helped shape me into the leader that I am today. Many of, many of you may have seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge, or at least read the book, a true story about a young medic in World War II named Desmond Doss, a conscientious objector who earned the Medal of Honor for his actions in saving the lives of numerous men during fights in Okinawa. Initially, he was rejected by soldiers in his company for refusing to carry a weapon. And it was based on his religious beliefs. Under fire, Private Doss exhibited valor that inspired his fellow soldiers to continue fighting to victory and saved many lives, one at a time. And he was quoted as saying, as he went back each time under fire at risk to his own life, without a weapon, dragging his comrades out, and then just saying, just one more, Lord, just one more, to give him the strength to go back and just get one more. As a leader, never write someone off because you don't think that they can contribute to the team. What if they had written off Desmond Doss thinking, what can someone do that won't carry a weapon? How can he contribute to our team? Well, there are many people that were alive that would not have been if Desmond Doss was not a teammate. So again, never write someone off whether due to their rank, their title, or their beliefs. I doubt that many of the artillerymen at the Battle of Washington thought that uh, Mary Corbin was ready and able to man the cannon in the heat of battle. But she was, and she stepped in during what have been, should have been a time of great grief and fought alongside other soldiers, committed to not really losing the battle. With the right inspiration, most people have the potential to lead and to accomplish great feats. Trust them and empower them. Make them feel like valued members of the team. Another thought on leadership is that leaders solve problems. They recognize and embrace their responsibility to help others find solutions. When individuals realize that their leaders truly care about their well-being and truly care about them as human beings, as my dad's cadre did when they got to know their soldiers. He knew that they truly cared about them, not just felt that they were an obligation or responsibility. When you're a leader and can, and can reach that point with your soldiers or those that you lead, you will have a team member that is bound by trust and commitment, not just obligation. When they come to you with their problems, it's because they have earned, you have earned their trust. And General Cal, uh, Colin Powell said it best, Leadership is solving problems. The day soldiers stop bringing their problems to you is the day that you've stopped leading them. They have either lost confidence that you can help them 
or concluded that you just don't care. Either is a failure of leadership. So what a great honor it is to know that someone respects and trusts you enough to seek your help. As tonight's celebration honors the courage and leadership of a woman named Margaret Corbin, I will close with a comment about one other woman who shaped who I am today. So you heard about my sisters, but the most influential female mentor in my life was my mother. She was a remarkable woman who was committed to making the world a better place for others. You may have been counting when I was mentioning my brothers and sisters and probably got to 10. Uh, and and what, you may, what you may not know is that I was one of 12 children that my parents adopted. So can you imagine that? I went from being an orphan with an uncertain future to a three-star general in the United States Army. Where else in the world is that? saw a problem, took the initiative to make an immediate impact by adopting 12 of us, and then took action to find families for so many others. She was responsible for many other accomplishments, like assisting in and desegregating Arlington Cemetery, and all other things when she was both a reporter with the Afro-American newspaper based in Baltimore, then when she also worked at the War Department, which is now the, the Secretary for the, um, the Department of Defense. But I did say I would finish by midnight, and I'll leave the rest of that story for another time. So suffice it to say that my mom may not have been a CEO of a large corporation and led thousands of troops in uniform, but it was clear that she was a leader. And she always reminded me that it doesn't matter where or how you start. It matters where and how you finish. It matters what you do with the opportunities you were given. And I provide that guidance that she, give, she gave to me. Do not let anyone tell you what you can or cannot accomplish. Do not let anyone tell you that you cannot pursue your dreams. Be courageous, be compassionate, be competent. Be a person of character and integrity. Be genuine in your actions and others will seek your leadership. So thank you again so much for allowing me to spend some time with you this evening. It's been truly an honor. Thank you so much again for the honor of the award That's in, uh, in the name of, of Ms. Corbin. And thank you for all that you do. I mean, God bless you and God bless the United States of America.